You know, it's awesome to see when, when God really gets a hold of somebody's heart. You know, it's such a beautiful thing to, to experience for yourself, but even to see God doing that in people's lives, it's, it's just so awesome. And, and when that happens, many times it leads to some radical changes and some radical commitments many times in people's lives. And sometimes those changes happen as soon as someone uh, understands the gospel and opens their heart to Jesus and, and trusts in him and, and calls him into their life. Other times it happens later. Sometimes when a Christian finally starts to take his or her relationship with Jesus seriously. And man, the things that sometimes happen is, is awesome. And I've seen believers who live in Religious cultures around the world uh, just clean out when, when they make a decision to follow Jesus, go back home cleaning out stuff in their house and in their cars and in their uh, pantries at times and uh, from all the uh, religious figurines and symbols and artwork sometimes and, and just all these different things maybe that until then they just uh, superstitiously trusted in or maybe talked to and prayed to or, or rubbed with their hands and things that, that, that were so much part of their culture or their belief system and, and realizing so many different things changes and and at times when it kind of awakens them to to the idolatry of it at times I, i've seen people throw out things that are worth a ton of money sometimes and you may i mean people thought they were crazy when they did things because of their commitment to follow jesus and trust jesus and only jesus and it's amazing. You may have read just from, you know, a couple hundred years ago from the old Welsh revivals over in, uh, in Great Britain where there were times where dozens of taverns in town would go out of business, not because they were forced to shut down, but because they lost customers, uh, because so many people were giving up uh, some of their addictions and vices and following Jesus and, and giving Jesus control of their life. And just things started happening and changing Maybe there was a time in your life where you needed to get rid of some things in your life, some things maybe in your home, maybe on your computer, maybe on your phone or your playlist or things in your social media account. I don't know. Uh, uh, but anywhere else because you realize that they were a negative and hurtful influence or temptation uh, of things that you were allowing into your life and your heart. And you got to the point you realized, you know what? This stuff's got to go. Maybe you made some people mad when you did that. <laughs> that happens sometimes. Maybe your friends and family members thought that you were crazy. Maybe you're accused of being a radical. Or maybe you have no idea what I'm talking about <laughs> because you've never taken your relationship with Jesus that seriously and you don't want to be that person. You've never really been willing to give up things that are hurting your relationship with God or hurting your walk with him. Today we're going to read a historical account as we're going through God's Word together. We're going to read an absolutely unbelievable example of what happened in a community when some people started making some changes because of their commitment to Jesus. And it was absolutely crazy. And, and what, what God did but then what happened as a result of that? And we're going to continue what we've been doing. We're tracing the journey of the gospel going from Jerusalem, crossing cultural barriers, language barriers to the world. As we trace through the history book of the New Testament in the Bible, the book of Acts. And so if you can turn with me there, if you have a Bible access on your phone or your tablet, or we have uh, Bibles there in the pews in front of you, if you want to grab one of those. And the table of contents at the front has a list of all the books in the first part of the Bible, the Old Testament, the latter part of the Bible, the New Testament. And, and we're in a book called Acts, Acts of the Apostles. And, and we're in chapter 19. And as we're going through this historical record, and we're going to see some things that happened that have been historically proven because they're fact and we, we get to read about them through God's word. And, and we've been walking this journey with 
our forefathers of, 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 as followers of Jesus said, in our last message, and, and, and listen, if you miss out some of these messages, I know some people uh, can't be with us at certain times. You can go back on YouTube and, and our channel, and I know they're gathering uh, recordings of, of all the messages in this series and other ones there if you if you'd like to catch up on some of that. But in our last message, we saw how the Apostle Paul has spent, of all his different missionary travels, he spent two years in a city, uh, the city of Ephesus, which is on the western coast of what is Turkey today. Uh, and he spent two years, he stopped and devoted two years of his life and of his, of his ministry with his team, uh, focusing on teaching and training believers in this city, uh, the city of Ephesus, in what seemed kind of set up like a Bible Institute format in a lecture hall like you would have maybe at a university uh, and, and owned by a believer named Tyrannus. And we talked about that in the last message, but those 24 months that he spent pouring in and equipping and training these people to, to, to serve God, to share the gospel, and to plant churches around their whole region, those 24 months proved to be very fruitful as those believers were kind of equipped to take the gospel to other cities and communities around their region. But those months, listen, they were not without incident or opposition. As you'll recall, uh, it was during this season of his life that he wrote uh, a letter to the Corinthians. We won't turn there, but it's on the screen. 1 Corinthians 16, Paul writes this from Ephesus, and he says, But I will tarry, or I'll stay at Ephesus until Pentecost, one of the Jewish feasts. He said, For a great door and effectual is opened unto me. He says, And there are many adversaries. In other words, he's saying there are I, I, I'm staying here a little longer because there, God has given me some great opportunities, uh, there, some effective ministry possibilities, but there are also many, many, many adversaries against what God's doing. As we continue through this narrative, we're going to see both revival and resistance in Ephesus. So join us with me, if you would, in God's word. This is not my message. These are not my words. Uh, but we want to just connect our hearts to what God has given to us uh, in his word. And we're going to begin, as we have throughout this series, gathering the facts as we're here uh, in Acts chapter 19. We're going to jump in at verse 11. And the first things we read about, we're going to read about healing, deliverance, and revival. Uh, look what happens in, in verse 11, uh, starting there. The Bible says this, Acts chapter 19, verse 11. Or, and God wrought or performed special miracles by the hand of, hands of Saul, so that from his body, this is oh, unbelievable. It says that from his body were brought into the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. And then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and Jews, a chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews, all the Greeks, all the Gentiles, also dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all the men. And they counted the price of them, those books, and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. God was doing some absolutely incredible things in this city of Ephesus, specifically through the Apostle Paul. And this was, as we told before, it's one of those transition moments when the, the New Testament hadn't been completed yet. And so God was doing a lot of unprecedented temporary type things that were happening to confirm the preaching uh, of God's people when they were going into places they've never been before. And no, he wasn't acting like some of those faith healers you, you see on television that, that want you to send you their sweaty handkerchiefs, you know, so you can send them a donation or something like that. Uh, this was not that at all. Uh, but this was remarkable. Verse 11 says that God was doing these special miracles. That word miracle is the Greek word uh, dunamis, like the word dynamite. And it refers to the supernatural power of God. God was doing some special, unique, extraordinary things, but the basically 
the power of God was working. And it's the same word that Paul used in Romans 1.16 when he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God, the salvation of everyone who believes. He says, it's the power of God. That's the power that was working here through Paul. And there were these special God, miracle working power of God uh, that works in our life. It's the same power that was working through Paul here, through the Apostle Paul. And God was doing some things that were very unusual, very extraordinary. And, and, and they were doing things that, in other words, these were things that not you and I uh, are supposed to try and imitate and repeat today. These were just unique manifestations of God's power. But I want you to notice what was happening around Ephesus at this time. It talks about handkerchiefs, and it talks about aprons. The handkerchiefs are like pieces of cloth or towels that they would use for different purposes. And the aprons, remember, Paul was a tent maker. That's how he kind of made his, uh, provided for himself. He worked with leather, these, these uh, goat skin leather tents. And so he worked with leather, and they had these smocks that they would use when they worked. And so it was that kind of a, uh, uh, an apron or these cloths that he would use and, uh, and, and, and that were connected to Paul. And he would use those when he's working or different circumstances. And, and so they would take some of these cloths, some of these towels, some of these aprons uh, that would have touched Paul's skin. In, okay, and, and they were taken to people who were sick or who were possessed with demons. Uh, and, and when those cloths and those materials would touch their bodies, it says that their diseases left them. And it says the, the, they were immediately healed. The demons were cast out of them just by touching the material that had touched Paul's body. I mean, that's incredible. It was, I mean, only God can do that. And it wasn't anything supernatural about Paul, but again, God was doing unprecedented, miraculous, temporary things to confirm the preaching of the gospel, and it got everybody's attention. And that's when we meet this strange group of brothers who were Jewish, and they were paying attention too. Because they, they, their dad was a Jewish man by the name of Siva or Skiva. And he calls him like a chief priest or high priest. Maybe that was just a title he gave himself uh, in, in those days, whether it was legitimate or not, we don't know. But he had seven sons. And all of them, the Bible says, were exorcists. You know, like movies, you know, like they're casting out demons. You know, that's what these Jewish men would do, these brothers. And there were seven of them. And there, if you notice there uh, in verse um, 13, it, they're referred to as vagabond. I know that's a word that a lot of times we think of like, you know, homeless and jobless people living under bridges, you know, this is not that. That word basically means they were itinerant. In other words, they, these guys would travel from place to place, town to town, community uh, after community, offering their amazing services to the people of this town and, uh, and to unsuspecting community, kind of like we used to have like the old traveling salesmen, you know, that would go, anybody seen Music Man? You know, they're traveling from town to town, and some, a lot of them are con artists, you know, snake oil and all this kind of stuff. And so, so they're going from town to town as extras is claiming all this power, and they had this very influential dad. And, and so they're going this. And, and now, if these men had power, it certainly wasn't from God. But when they saw the real power, the real power of God through Paul and all this stuff that was going on, uh, they wanted a piece of the action. They wanted in on this, you know, and so they started, they started imitating him. They started imitating Paul and Paul's message, but they didn't really know Jesus. But they wanted to, to be like, have the power like those who did know Jesus. And, uh, and so they, they would start reciting their spells and their incantations over people who were, the, and, but this way, if you can have a, an industry of, as an exorcist, that tells you there was a lot of spiritual oppression going on in that part of the world. And, and there are parts of the world even today uh, that, that there is just a lot of demonic oppression in position, people's lives, more than a lot of times we, uh, we, we see firsthand. But that's what they were doing, and they would recite their incantations and their spells uh, uh, over people. Uh, but it was obvious that they didn't really know Jesus, but they were trying to imitate Paul who did know Jesus. And they would say something like, we rebuke you in the name of the Jesus that Paul preaches. What, what he said. <laughs> and, you know, and, and that's, you know, then something funny happens. I mean, it's funny to us. 
but it, was, it scared them half to death because demons are real and demons are powerful. And they go to the one particular house and the demon speaks back to them. And you catch what he says? The demon speaking through this person, whoever it was, speaks back to these seven brothers and says, yeah, we know Jesus. And we know the apostle Paul. But who in the world are you? <laughs> and then even demons saying this. And, and just to show off the, its power, that demon-possessed man, it says he leaped on these men. And the, the idea, the way the words use it, it, it's like a panther jumping on its prey. And so he leaps on them, and with supernatural physical strength, that man overpowers these seven exorcists, and he takes them all down. This is one taking on seven grown men, and he takes them all down. He overpowers them, uh, and, and he's tearing their clothes and beating them up physically until all they could do was run for their lives. Well, that got even more public attention. And it tells us that everybody living in Ephesus heard about this. I mean, that kind of stuff, word spreads fast, right? And it says when they heard this, people began to fear God and had, have unbelievable respect for the name of Jesus doesn't mean they necessarily became believers, but they took Jesus seriously. And many of the people did begin to turn to Jesus and open their hearts and lives to Jesus and become true believers. And when they made that decision, it wasn't just a game. It wasn't just you do that to, to get people to, to clap or anything like that. They were serious about this. And when they became true, they, they turned to Jesus, some radical things started happening in their life. The decisions they made were significant. And a revival starts breaking out in Ephesus. From what we read there, in verse 18 and 19, it tells us that people who believed in Jesus, they would come and they would publicly confess their faith commitment to Jesus and they would talk about and share the changes that they were making in their life. And talk about changes. It tells us that a lot of the people who gave their lives to Jesus were involved in witchcraft, which kind of tells you what kind of culture this was at the time. A lot of them were involved in witchcraft and that phrase, um, curious arts, that's there in verse 19, that speaks of sorcery and magic. And all these new believers started going through their stuff. They started going through their things and their bookshelves and they, and they started bringing uh, uh, all their books of spells and incantations and witchcraft and sorcery stuff and, and paraphernalia, and they started bringing it to where the believers were gathering, and, and they started this massive bonfire. They started burning this stuff up. They didn't want to have anything to do with this anymore because they were following the one and true God, the living God, Jesus. And it wasn't in secret either. They weren't going behind the barn where nobody would know that they were becoming followers of Jesus, you know. Uh, they were doing this out in the open where everybody could see what was going on and that they were serious about their decision to follow Jesus and to please God. And it was a major financial sacrifice too. If you recall what we read, the value of all those books, I mean, books today have some value, but back then... They were really valuable. They didn't have the printing press or anything like that. It tells us that those books were valued at 50,000 pieces of silver. That's, and we don't know for sure, it's somewhere, that's like $10,000 worth of material. And they were burning it up. And as decisions like that were being made, it says that the word of God, the gospel kept spreading and spreading and growing and growing mightily and overcoming the power of darkness. It says the gospel prevailed. It was winning against our enemy. The enemy was being defeated, but he was not going to go down without a fight, as we're about to see. Before we get to that, the next couple of verses, we see Paul making tentative plans. Look as it continues, verses 21 and 22 says this. And after these things were ended, 
Paul purposed in his spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia. Remember, that's the Greek peninsula, Macedonia up north, Greek, Greece down south, uh, Achaia down south. He said, passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go back to Jerusalem, over back to Israel, saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome over in Italy. And so he went into, and so he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus, or Tim, Timothy, and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia or in Ephesus for a season. So when the situation calms down, Paul started making plans to, to move on to his next place of, of ministry, his next phase of ministry travels. And, and he's thinking long term. He's, he's, he's uh, had some God-sized goals and dreams for the future. He wanted to go back to Greece, then back through Macedonia, Achaia, visiting all those churches that he had helped plant in the first, uh, second missionary journey. And then he wanted to go back to Jerusalem again uh, uh, another time. And from there, he says he wants to go to Rome. And not that he's going on vacation. He not wanted to, to get, go on tourism. He wanted to go to Rome because of the gospel. And man, if the gospel could take seat in Rome, at the heart of the Roman Empire, it truly would change the world. And that's where he wanted to go. Now, these were Paul's plans, okay? These were Paul's goals. These were Paul's dreams that were rooted in his call, his ministry calling, but that happened so many times in his life God would do things, but he would do it in his time and in his way. And yes, Paul would eventually make it back to Jerusalem. And yes, he would eventually go to Rome, but his trip to Rome would not be the way he planned it. God was going to get him there, but as only God can orchestrate things, and God was going to make sure that even Rome picked up the bill. He was going to get him there. But it wasn't how Paul planned, and our life is rarely the way we plan. But in the meantime, Paul sends two of his team members on ahead, Timothy and Erastus, some of his most faithful partners and companions, and, and they go on to Macedonia. And Paul chooses to stay back in Ephesus a little longer. And after we're about to read, he probably wished he had left town uh, after we see what's about to happen because things were about to get crazy. Because as we keep reading through this chapter, we're going to see the people in the community feel threatened by the gospel, as you can imagine. Look what happens in verse 23. In the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. That's, remember, that's Jesus' followers. They didn't call them Christians. They followed the way, Jesus. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom when he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be not gods which are made with hands, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worships. During this season in which Paul kind of stayed back in Ephesus, things began to escalate quickly. There were some tensions that started to, uh, to develop uh, around the, the way, these followers of Jesus. And, and we meet a man by the name of Demetrius. And he was a tradesman, a craftsman. He was a local craftsman. And uh, he didn't work with leather like Paul did, uh, but he worked, he was a silversmith. And verse tells us that he, quote, made silver shrines to Diana. What in the world does that mean? Now, it's important for any of this to make sense, to understand a little about their community and their culture and this industry, because we're not as familiar with it today. But the city of Ephesus was home to the world-famous Temple of Diana, or Artemis is how the Greeks called it. The Romans called her Diana. The Greeks called her Ar Artemis. And this temple was built over 500 years before Jesus came on the scene, okay? That temple took over 220 years to build. And the temple of Diana was built of pure white marble. 
And this temple had 127 columns. Every one of those columns was 60 feet tall. That's over five stories tall, 127 of them of pure marble. This was an architectural masterpiece, okay? And this temple, inside the temple of Diana, they displayed some of the greatest masterpieces of art of their time, some of the greatest sculptures uh, and paintings and artworks from around the world were housed in this temple, which is kind of like a, a museum, but at the centerpiece of all of those things, more important than the sculptures and the paintings or anything else, was behind this curtain and up on a shrine, there was a statue of the famous statue of Diana. I'm going to see the picture there on the screen for you. This is, this is historical fact. I mean, this has actually been found. The Ephesians believed that this statue had fallen from the sky, from Jupiter, from Zeus. And like so many religious superstitions that you see around the world where people just think some, you know, things like that happen so they can start worshiping it. And this actual statue, as you see there, has been excavated by archaeologists and is now in a museum. This really happened. The Temple of Diana was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And... We can just read about it because we obviously have never seen it. And so around all of this, there was this huge industry that grew up, this huge business industry that was built around Ephesus, around the temple of Diana and the worshiping of Diana. And so these craftsmen, these silversmiths, they would make these miniature versions of the temple, these miniature shrines that, that, they, that they would build for, and people would buy them and they cost a lot of money and, and they were made out of pure silver and they weren't uh, like souvenirs, okay? They, they, were, they were little idols or religious charms uh, like so many people have religious figurines today and they would, you know, trust in them and talk to them and pray to them and, and rub them and, 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 and they would have these figurines and the market for those shrines was huge. It says they made their wealth by making and selling these. And so the market was huge as long as people were worshiping this pagan God. But when people by the dozens, if not hundreds, became followers of Jesus, they stopped worshiping pagan gods and pagan idols and they stopped buying the shrines. And that's when things hit the fan because with the silversmiths because it hit their wallets. And so we meet this man called Demetrius. And he calls a, a union meeting with all the other tradesmen, They're all, the, all the silversmiths, they got together because their industry was taking a hit. And he lays out his case with the, with the, other, the other the men. And he really wasn't worried about spiritual matters he was worried about their source of income, their job security. And the market was drying up. And Demetrius says, guys, you know that not just here in Ephesus, but all over this continent, this guy named Paul is persuading people to turn from their religious belief systems, to turn from their practices in order to follow Jesus. And he's telling people that, the, that gods that are made by human hands aren't really gods. Go figure. <laughs> He was, it was true. And Demetrius says, so not only is this destroying our industry and our livelihood, but it's turning people away from the temple of Diana and diminishing her greatness and diminishing her splendor. And Demetrius gets on and he's got on this bandwagon and he's talking. I mean, he's like a politician on the campaign trail, you know, throwing red meat at his base and, 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 and giving them what they needed to hear. And that's exactly how they responded. And when he does this, as we're going to see, mass chaos breaks out. No surprise. Look what happens in verse 28. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one into the theater. And when Paul would have entered into the temple, the disciples suffered him not. They wouldn't allow him to do that. 
And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into that theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore or why they were come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander, beckoning with his hand, would have men made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Man, you attack somebody's money and their religion at the same time, and you got a dangerous situation on your hands. And these men became furious and started yelling, great is Diana of the Ephesians. They start chanting it like, you know, rites and stuff you see at times on TV. And it says the whole city was filled with confusion, chaos, out of control. And this mob grabs two men who were part of Paul's missionary team. They didn't catch Paul. They found two men, Gaius and Aristarchus. Both of them were from Macedonia over in Greece, maybe Thessalonica, maybe Berea. We don't know. But then they take them and they drag them straight to this big outdoor public theater. And you see the screen there. And this amphitheater place was huge with this big uh, seating that could sit hundreds of people and down at the center of it down in the front it was the platform down low where they where they could have anybody who, who would be there and the theater was not just a great place to do a concert or 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 to have a big public celebration it was also the ideal place for a crowd to assemble and have a big public spectacle and so that's where they dragged Gaius and Aristarchus and tons of people started showing up and walking from around Ephesus to go to this theater. Paul was not about to let those men go in alone. And he wants to go be with them and stand with them. But it tells us the other disciples in town wouldn't let him go. They're like, Paul, you cannot go in there. They're probably thinking they will kill you. It says that there was, he had some friends who were influential in the community. They're called the chief of Asia. That's the Greek word, Asiarchs. They were high-ranking officers in the province of Asia. And they were friends with Paul, and they sent messages to him saying, you do not want to go to that place. Don't go to that theater. And so he didn't. He stayed back. And meanwhile, in the theater, there was still mass chaos and confusion. It tells us here that some were yelling one thing, others were yelling something else. And I, I want you to notice... In verse 32, the word assembly. It says the assembly was confused. That word assembly is the Greek word ekklesia. And that word appears three times in this chapter, assembly. And that Greek word ekklesia is the same word translated church in the Bible. See, the the, the idea of church, the ekklesia, wasn't a new concept. But Jesus used it to refer to this assembly, the local New Testament church is the ecclesia of Jesus. Not just any ecclesia, the one of Jesus, a physical assembly of people who've been called out for the purposes and mission of God. But there were other ecclesias, there were other assemblies, like this mob that gathered together, and there were legal ecclesias, uh, gatherings that that, that would be held, and uh, things like this. And verse 32 tells us that the majority of the people in the theater had no idea why they were even there. And that's kind of what happens when you get this big public uh, chaos. It was just a big spectacle that formed, drawing more and more attention, more and more curiosity. What's going on in the theater? So more and more people start showing up, but they don't even know why they're even there. And at that point, some of the Jews pushed forward this man named Alexander. We don't know if he's a Christian or he was just one of the local Jews. And and so they put him forward down in front of of the theater to see if he can calm things down. And and he raises his hands, hoping for people to be quiet so that he could speak. And that backfired completely because as soon as the Gentile crowd knew that Alexander was a Jewish, uh, and they kind of lumped the Christians and Jews together. They're all like the foreigners and they're all enemies of our religion. And so they just... As soon as they saw that he was a Jew, it says they began chanting for two hours straight. Great is Diana of the Ephesians, chanting that over and over. I mean, you could go home and watch a movie during that time. And they're still chanting. Two straight hours. This goes on. The whole scene was a mess. 
Thankfully, at this point, eventually, cooler heads prevail. Look what happens in verse 35. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, You men of Ephesus, what man is there that knows not how the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter or Zeus? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and to do nothing rashly. For you have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies. Let them implead one another. But if you inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly, ecclesia. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly, the ecclesia, the gathered, the crowd. This town clerk was a magistrate with lots of authority. He's the one who finally got things to calm down. And his words were thoughtful and were effective. And he begins by addressing their passions and their loves and validating kind of their heart and, and their love for the goddess Diana and Apparently, the people of Ephesus were considered guardians of the temple, okay, and the, of the statue that they believe fell from Jupiter, from the sky. And that word in, in verse 35, it says, uh, that word worshiper, the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper. Uh, that word worshiper comes from a Greek word that means a temple keeper, a, war, a warden, a guardian and that's how they saw themselves. They were guardians of the shrine. They were guardians of the temple. And they took that role seriously because she and the temple were under attack. And we got to protect her. That's our job. We're the guardians. And so the town clerk then says, listen, since that's undisputed, everybody knows that already, then y'all just need to calm down and be quiet. <laughs> and he confronts them for having grabbed Gaius and Aristarchus when they really hadn't done anything wrong or illegal. That phrase, robbers of churches in verse 37, doesn't talk about churches, ecclesia, not at all. It's talking about temple robbers, temple thieves. But then I want you to notice something. He says that they were not, these Christians were not blasphemers of your goddess. Don't Missed that. In other words, these preachers were not attacking the goddess Diana by name, which would have been considered blasphemy. This town clerk, this unsaved legal authority, says they have not robbed anything from our temples and they have not blasphemed Diana. Don't miss that because there's a principle here when it comes to sharing the gospel. This principle is huge, not only for cross-cultural missionaries and church planters, but for Christians and churches everywhere. Paul and his team clearly preached the gospel, and they clearly preached against idolatry, but they did not go directly after Diana, probably because it would have been seen as blasphemy. It would have immediately have offended the Ephesians and their cultural identity and would have shut down any chance for them to hear the message of Jesus. They were not doing it because they were cowards, but they were being wise and considerate and respectful. In other words, when you share the gospel with unbelievers, you need to speak the truth. But you need to be sensitive and respectful and humble and tactful so that you don't drive away the very people you're trying to love and reach. Missionaries face this challenge all the time when they're in, cult in cultures, maybe they're in Muslim cultures or predominantly Roman Catholic cultures or Hindu or secular cultures or whatever it is. But so do Christians in churches everywhere, even in America. And I say that because you need to think about this when you share your faith, whether it's in person or when you post things on social media. 
You need to pay attention to what you say and how you say it, even if it's true. Too often Christians will post things that get other Christians maybe to like them or to be impressed with them or just to vent because they're frustrated. But what they post is incredibly insensitive and disrespectful and arrogant at times or rude toward people who are lost, who are spiritually blind, who have different belief systems and opinions. How in the world are we going to reach people with the gospel, with the love of Christ, and with the truth of God when we act and speak in ways that drives people away? Paul's team had not acted that way toward the Ephesians, towards their culture, towards their pagan customs, and the leaders of the town even knew it. This man was not a Christian. He stands up and he says, they have not done this. And at this point, the town clerk says, listen, if Demetrius and the silversmiths, if they've got a legal issue, then take it up with the legal authorities. He says, if they have any other issues, then take it up with other lawful gatherings or assemblies, but not this way. This is wrong. He then basically warns them, if they don't stop this, if they don't break this up, they're going to have to answer to the authorities for causing this riot and insurrection without a just cause because they haven't committed a crime and they haven't committed blasphemy. And when he's done talking, he dismisses that crowd and the chapter ends. <laughs> Man, I can't imagine what it must have been like to live through this moment. I mean, the revival that had broken out earlier was amazing, but the resistance was intense. And in the end, God was still in control and God's work kept moving forward. Jesus said he was going to build his church. He said the gates of hell can't stand against it. And that's exactly what happened. Let me give you some takeaways as we wrap up our time in God's word and just try and filter it down to some practical things that we can think about and wrestle with. The first one is this. The power of Jesus only comes through a living relationship with Jesus. You, can't, you can try to look like a Christian. You can try to talk like a Christian and act like a Christian you think is supposed to be. And you can try to convince people that you're a Christian. But until you truly open your heart to a personal relationship with Jesus, then this transforming power of the gospel will be missing in your life. You might have religion, but you don't have a real relationship with Jesus. And that's where the power comes from. Just like Paul and all those people trying to imitate him. It's just superficial. So maybe the step you need to take today is to truly open your heart to Jesus. I would love for you to do that. Sadly, there's, there's a lot of times that we as Christians, we miss out on the power of Jesus that's available to us because we neglect our relationship with Jesus. Oh, we can get all the rules and we can follow. We know what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to be. And, and we, can, we try to do things in our own strength or try to just try harder and harder to perform. And all we do, we're just, it just leaves us exhausted and feeling defeated and feel like, I can't do this. Because the truth is you can't. You're not supposed to. What we need to do is focus on getting closer to Jesus, on abiding in Jesus and simply allowing him to live through us because he's, he's the one with the power, not you, not me. But the power of Jesus comes with a living relationship with him. And if you don't know it, him in that way, as the gospel shares, then that's your starting place today. That's your next step. If you want to turn from your own ways and your own sin to follow Jesus. Receive the life we've been singing about, the forgiveness of our sin, the one who gives us hope to be with Jesus forever. The second thing is this. Putting Jesus first in your life may require some radical changes. I mean, this is going to look different for everybody. I'm not going to give you a list of things because that's not what it's about. But there may be, if you're serious about following Jesus, there may be some things in your life and your habits and your behavior, some things that you need to get rid of immediately because of what they're doing to your life and your heart. 
And I'm not saying that you can set yourself free from sinful habits and addictions and spiritual strongholds in your life. Only Jesus can do that. But there may be some things that you already know should not be a part of your life. And you need to take some steps today to get rid of them, to get, eliminate them from your life, from your home, from your phone, from your shopping list, your watch list, whatever it is, whatever that looks like in your life. But take your relationship with Jesus seriously. Third, opposition to the gospel may become intense at times. Listen, I hope you never have to face the kind of physical and violent persecution that we've just read about because it's real. And there are Christians around the world today that go through this and much worse today. But if you do, don't be surprised because our enemy wants nothing more than to stop God's people from sharing the hope of Jesus with the world that is trapped in spiritual darkness and bondage. He doesn't want people to be set free. He's got a stronghold and he's not going to let go of it easily. But no matter what opposition you face for living out the gospel, God's power is greater and his work will never be stopped because that's his promise. And the last thing is this. Sharing the gospel requires boldness, but also grace, compassion, and sensitivity. It's not just about sharing God's truth. It's about reflecting God's heart. Can I say that again? It's not just about sharing God's truth. It's about reflecting his heart when you do it. So examine your words, examine your tone, your attitude, and be sure that what you say and how you say it and what you post and how you post or whatever is always respectful and humble and compassionate. May it reflect the real heart of Jesus. That's who the world needs to see. Can I ask you please to, to stand to your feet and, and be still for just a moment longer? Can we bow our heads and just close our eyes for a moment if you're comfortable doing that? Just, just to have a time to be still. I know we've sung a lot of songs and you've heard me share a lot of things. And I appreciate your attention and your patience. But really it all comes down to where you and God are right now. Because listen, if you're a Christian, but there are things maybe that as we go through God's word that God has brought to your mind and your heart and you're like, I've got to do this then I want to challenge you right now to spend some time. Maybe you want to come and get on your knees and talk to God. Maybe right where you are, you want to sit down. But just can you respond to God? If God's spoken to you, you should respond to him. And if there's a decision you need to make, a commitment, there's some things that you have got to take, take steps right now. Maybe you want to come and talk to somebody and have one of our prayer team just pray with you about it. Listen, don't be embarrassed about that. Don't be ashamed about that. There's nothing that God wants and that we as God's people want. And you can do that right now. Maybe some things that you realize that you've done that don't reflect the heart of God. And maybe you just need to spend some time in repentance, asking God for forgiveness, for grace, and for strength and power to walk differently. But friend, if you're here and you've never made the most important decision of your life, and that is to give your life to Jesus. Listen, in a moment we're going to sing. If you need to come and talk to me or talk to somebody here, about, you want to make that decision, you come and we'll show you in the Bible how, what God says. But really it's a step that you have got to take on your own for yourself in your heart. I can't do it for you and nobody else can. Once you understand that God loves you, that you're guilty of sin like the rest of the world, you've broken God's commandment and God's law and God's heart. And our sin separates us from God and will keep us forever separated from him and condemned for it. 
But that's exactly why Jesus came to rescue you, to prove his love, to pay, shed his blood, to pay for the sins that you have committed against God, to spare you from having to pay for it. And he rose from the dead and he says, if you will turn to me and give me your life, I will forgive you of all the sin you've ever committed or will ever commit. I will forgive you. I will come into your life. I will save your soul. I will adopt you to my family. You'll become mine and I'll be yours forever. And so all you need to do, whether you're here in this room, whether you're watching online, you need to have a conversation with God right now. And just say something to the effect of, God, forgive me for my sin. Thank you for loving me. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Right now, I choose to believe and trust in you, Jesus, to save me, to rescue me. Jesus, I invite you to come into my life right now. I want to live for you from now on. I want to follow you. Change whatever you need to change. Please save my soul. Friend, when you take that step, if you have just done that, the Bible says that you are forgiven. And you're a son or a daughter of God. And God is living in you and with you. And Listen, if you've made that decision now or you want to come and talk to somebody about that, then you do that. But listen, can you share that with someone? Can you let somebody know what you just did? Because we want to help you and walk with you and help point you in the right direction. Don't try to walk this journey alone. God, I don't know what you're doing in every heart. Only you know that. But God, as we sing this song as a response of worship to you, I pray that we would respond with humility and brokenness and trust and faith to whatever you're asking of us right now. God, maybe there's some burdens that your people need to give to you. Then, God, here we are to do that. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.